Now, some of the greatest literary minds of the 20th century were shaped by their service in the First World War. We've all heard of J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, Oxford Dons, close friends and members of the Inklings, an informal group of writers that met regularly at the Eagle and Child pub in Oxford to discuss literature and epic fantasy. Tolkien is famous for his Lord of the Rings trilogy and The Hobbit, and Lewis for the Chronicles of Narnia. Both men saw war up close, the mud, the death, and the waste, and their young minds were imprinted by the destruction of a vanished world they once knew. The war touched them physically too, Tolkien with trench fever, Lewis with shrapnel wounds. Both were invalided back home to England where, in the still of convalescence, they mourned close friends killed on the Western Front. From this came some of the greatest works of literature of the last century. Tolkien wrote The Lord of the Rings from 1937 to 1954. Undeniably, its themes were shaped by his wartime service and the turmoil of the Second World War and the Cold War that followed. On publication in 1954, many were quick to identify the ring with atomic weapons and Mordor with the Soviet Union. Was Sauron, the dark ruler of Mordor, who desired to rule supreme over Middle Earth, just a stand-in for Joseph Stalin? Lewis dealt with these questions in his review of the first two books, noting that Tolkien started well before the atom was split and while Nazi Germany was Europe's greatest scourge, ahead of the USSR at the time. Indeed, the real power of the Lord of the Rings is, as Lewis wrote, the way, and I quote, it teaches us that Sauron is eternal. The War of the Ring is only one of a thousand wars against him. Every time we shall be wise to fear his ultimate victory, after which there will be no more songs. Again and again, we, we shall have good evidence that the wind is setting east and the withering of all woods may be drawing near. Every time we win, we know that our victory is impermanent. And so if we insist on asking for the moral of the story, that is the moral. A recall from facile optimism and wailing pessimism alike to that hard yet not quite desperate insight into man's unchanging predicament by which heroic ages have lived. They lived in gloomy times, yet the message of the story is hopeful. It's a story that speaks to us and our modern celebration of Tolkien clearly shows there is a market for hope out there as we too live in gloomy times. Today at home, there is incredible pressure on our society and our economy. Inflation is on the rise with interest rates hot on its heels, along with the price of electricity, fuel and groceries. The cost of living rises with little relief in sight. Everything is going up except wages. And the question at every level is whether we can afford what we need. Abroad, the war in Ukraine burns away, no close to the end than when it started. And now the spectre of nuclear attack looms over Europe like a dark cloud. Closer to home, the People's Republic of China concluded its 20th Communist Party Congress last month, with President Xi consolidating his absolute power and control over the party and the people. It caps a turbulent year thus far, if not a successful one for authoritarian regimes, where Xi and Putin remain committed to their no-limits partnership. Russia has brutally seized parts of Ukraine. Chinese rockets streaked across the skies of Taiwan. And Chinese influence has projected deep into the Pacific island chain, ensnaring the heart of at least one national leader. The Sogavari beijing Security Pact is a startling reminder that there is a growing geopolitical contest taking place on our front doorstep. And if you're an observer of Western democracies, we don't seem to be faring all that well ourselves, with the United Kingdom now onto their third Prime Minister in four months. You'd be right to wonder about the resilience of our democratic institutions in these times. But tough as the situation may be, I remain at heart cautiously hopeful. I'm a student of history and I appreciate that there is nothing new under the sun, especially political breakfast speeches like this one. Every problem that we have before us has been faced by a previous generation in one form or another. That's the message of the Lord of the Rings. History and literature at its best remind us of the realities of life and keep us from facile optimism or wailing pessimism. They keep us grounded. Our times are different, but we are dealing with people and human nature hasn't changed through the centuries. What matters still are the virtues, courage, prudence, perseverance, and to quote Tolkien himself, great deeds that are not wholly in vain. For Australia and the region, the future is neither orderly nor inevitable. We still have agency and judgment here today. Western Australia is uniquely sensitive to the geopolitical pressures of the moment, for we draw much of our wealth 
from China, from trade with China. A disturbance in our region could well compromise the prosperity of families and communities across our great state. But we also understand our vulnerability. It was only 80 years ago that WA was attacked 12 times, and in one attack on Broome, 88 people perished. We can chart a safe course through the challenges ahead with prudent leadership, but it won't be easy, for there are dangerous shoals ahead. The former US commander of the Indo-Pacific, Admiral Phil Davidson, sounded the ship's klaxon 18 months ago when he warned that China may attempt to take Taiwan by force within six years, by 2027. That's now four and a half years away. US Secretary of State Blinken recently said that Beijing was determined to pursue reunification on a much faster timeline. And only in the last fortnight, Chief of US Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, said China could move on Taiwan as early as this year or the next. The point is the window is closing fast, and these are considered words. We must take them seriously. We won't have nuclear submarines in the water by 2027. That's a reality. So how are we hedging against the risk of conflict arriving sooner rather than later? That's what Stephen Smith and Sir Angus Houston are considering in the Defence Strategic Review. I don't want to discuss particulars here today except to make clear that we need to build strike capabilities that can hold an adversary at risk beyond the archipelago to our north. Strike bombers, precision guided missiles and unmanned autonomous vehicles in the skies and in the seas below. The review will report in March and I understand an interim report is being presented to government this week. I remain hopeful for good outcomes, but I must say that last week's budget and the message it sent on defence does not inspire confidence. Inflation has defleted defence purchasing power and portfolio spending has taken a hit in real terms of $2.8 billion. If we are serious about the strategic challenges and the capabilities that we need, we must have an honest conversation about what we need to spend. And it must be well above 2% of GDP, that's just a fact. We do have a moral obligation to the Australian people to build and maintain a strong deterrent to any regional aggressor, to show that there is a great cost for any unilateral military adventurism. It is simply responsible national security and it is what Australians expect. The lesson of Ukraine and its lion-hearted defence is that we must first be prepared and able to defend ourselves if we expect the support of our allies and our neighbours. Even in war, just like in the Melbourne Cup yesterday, people like to back a winner. And we need to be able to punch back if, God forbid, we must wait for support from our friends. Given the stakes, the Coalition will always work constructively with the government to build a strong and capable Australian Defence Force and oppose anyone who hinders that sacred work. To that end, I want to focus now on how we find, recruit and keep the young men and women who need to build the Defence Force of the next two decades. The Albanese government has committed to the former coalition government's objective of growing the ADF by 18,500 people by 2040. That's net growth of 1,000 people per year, noting that in recent years, recruitment has only slightly exceeded departures from the ADF. You all know how tough the job market is right now. Defence over the past few years has only managed net growth of 300 people per year. So this is a huge task, especially with an ageing population and a declining fertility replacement rate. So apart from migration and having more babies, let's first consider the next generation of Australians we are looking to recruit, Generations Z and Alpha. Generation Z are the group born between 1995 and 2009, and genera Generation Alpha are born from 2009 onwards. They are digital natives, visual learners, born into the age of autonomous vehicles and big data. By 2030, they are projected to comprise 45% of the workforce. They will share many of the characteristics of my generation, Generation Y, those of us born between 1980 and 1994. And according to research, we value personal life and family above salary. We value diverse experiences. We like more control over our, over our career paths. We leave jobs and careers at a much higher rate than baby boomers. We don't like hierarchy, inflexibility and bureaucracy in our personal life or jobs, but who really does after all? In short, this looks like a tough assignment for a defence recruiter pitching for an organisation that is often inflexible, inherently hierarchical, sometimes tough on family life, and dem demands the subordination of self to the team and the mission. All that is necessary because in the end, serving the ADF is more than just a job. In fact, the profession of arms is a unique calling where you may be called upon to use lethal force 
and even lay down your life in defence of your country. Thankfully, Gen Y has been responsive and drawn to the call of public service. I joined the ADF after 9-11 and now serve in the parliament. In fact, we have a good number of veterans, including from Afghanistan, among the coalition MPs and senators in Canberra. But back to the question, how do we find and keep the 18,500 young Australians in the ADF? How do we recruit, retain and weave a new generation of soldiers, sailors and airmen into the fabric of our proud national story? First, I think we need a message that appeals to young hearts and minds searching for purpose. Emphasising the service ethos is critical. Duty, honour and country. These may seem antiquated, but they are values and principles that call people to stand and fight for something bigger than themselves. And aren't these the sort of values that you would want in your own employees? But watch an ADF recruitment ad online today. You might think joining the ADF was simply a vehicle for self-actualisation. Sure, there are benefits to service, but we need something more than self-interest if we're going to grow the force by 1,000 people per year. Kids are waiting to be inspired and challenged by traditional values of service to country and to their fellow Australians. And is it any wonder that some defence and national security businesses have taken their names from Lord of the Rings? I think of Strider, Palantir and Andural. Values and culture matter, that's the point, and they matter to young Australians. So what are we doing today to prepare them for the force of tomorrow? Second, we, we must make onboarding faster. Last year as Assistant Minister for Defence, I discovered that it took over 290 days from first contact to recruit training. The Australian Public Service was achieving the same milestone in less than half the time at around 148 days, which is still a long time if you're a, rec a recruiter. Far too much time is wasted and we need to accelerate the process or good people will be lost to other sectors of the economy like yours. I know many here can get it done much faster than defence. Third, we need to remove barriers to service, often bureaucratic ones imposed by risk-averse gatekeepers. I've met and heard from too many kids through my office who get turned away from defence because they've had a shoulder injury from footy, a food allergy that they've managed their whole life, or were medicated for ADHD in their childhood. All talented kids, motivated and open to grow, yet turned away because of risk culture. Not every job of the future requires the fitness of a fighter pilot, or the endurance of an infantry soldier. And we need to move beyond the one-size-fits-all model and select kids who might not tick all the boxes, but who can get the job done and then some. Fourth, we need to do a better job of keeping people in the ADF by giving them opportunities to study at a civilian university mid-career or perhaps taking a posting in the private sector where they might learn logistics, entrepreneurial skills, data analytics or leadership in a different setting. Incentives for home ownership are important, especially for a generation that feels locked out of the housing market in most of our major capital cities. The job market is more dynamic and so the ADF must increase its permeability by allowing movement in and out of the system without penalising those who choose to broaden their work experience. We need more pathways to return to uniform, not just pathways out. Finally, and my last point, we need to continually think about how we look after our serving families. Many of you in the resources sector understand the cost of the FIFO lifestyle to families. Defence shares the same challenge. Operations, career courses and exercises take time away from the family. And there are ways that we economise. COVID has demonstrated that we can achieve a lot through online learning, which may well save travel, on, uh, travel and time away, particularly for ADF career courses, which can often be quite onerous on top of exercises and other work-related travel. The simple truth is we must balance the benefits of bringing people together with managing the risks of keeping families apart. We cannot ignore or minimise the cost of wellbeing, productivity and commitment that relationship breakdown can have on personnel and their families. So in closing, and I'm looking forward to Q&A, it's going to be a busy decade ahead. There is much to be done and industry has a massive role to play in building our defence force and our national resilience. I hope this is the start of an ongoing conversation. So thanks for listening this morning. I look forward to answering some of your questions.